Okay, so the theme for the week is embodied awareness, and we're going to uh, do two practices today that will definitely give you a nice taste uh, of working with that in uh, different forms. So for the things I'm going to share with you, just pay attention to what calls to you that in whatever way that might be uh, something calls to your mind conceptually, or maybe something registers in the body and pay attention to that. Anything else, whether you just uh, doesn't call your attention or maybe even you're averse to it, you can let it float off, you know, uh, especially with embodiment. I think it's important to just pay attention to what's working in that moment, what's calling your attention. And that doesn't mean like avoiding your edge in practice, but um, no need to blast past it, especially with embodiment. So embodied awareness. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about the embodiment bit. And the simplest way that we describe that is inhabiting the body. And that's very much the instruction that Judith Blackstone gives. So, but I want to say here, uh, I'm going to give you various points. So we're going to kind of weave through here uh, uh, that hopefully by the time I'm done, you're set up uh, well enough to go into the practice. But by inhabiting the body, we're not setting up some um, competition or opposition within ourselves. We're moving from fragmentation to wholeness. So for example, sometimes embodiment or the body can be described like get out of your head and get into the body. No, your head is part of your body. <laughs> so don't, don't be reactive, get in the body. No, your emotions are part of your experience in your body. So everything you're experiencing is happening here in and through the body as well, okay? So that's really important. Everything's included here. And it's your birthright to be here in a body and to be endowed with awareness. So embodiment and awareness, this is already, you already have that, but we are working with it in a conscious way, just like we do with any other practice to make it uh, a more full, conscious experience. So another way of describing uh, embodiment is uh, awareness throughout the whole body. So everywhere throughout the body, we feel present and aware. So that's what we mean by inhabiting the body as well. There's also a simultaneity that can arise in the experience and Judith describes it as this, all of our senses function at the same time. Sensation, emotion, and cognition are simultaneous. We experience our inner world, our inner life, and outer life at the same time. Perceiver and perceived are a single perceptual field. So this is something that you don't need to remember this or think about it in practice, but by doing the practice, I find that even in the very beginning, even if it's only this much, we start noticing that simultaneity. And that can be characterized in different ways, but one of the ways is just a loosening on grip, a, a dissolving of fragmentation, like I am just here. You are just here. And we don't have to have an extra layer of vigilance or contractions, like oh, I need to be in my head, but not down here. I need to be down here and not up here whatever it might be, there's an activity that can just relax. And yet it's not a checking out. Everything is working. Everything is present and active. Awareness is, is present. Um, our sensitivity is present. Nothing is muted. And yet nothing is being overly driven, you know, overly emphasized. And there's not a balance being maintained either. Like, oh, I got to hold everything in just the right way. No, no, there is a relaxing. It's quite, it can be at first difficult to find, but even in small, small um, experiences, small percentages, it, it's quite a lovely experience because uh, I feel I can relax right here as I am. Now, I'm going to bounce back a little bit about inhabiting the body and differentiating from other potential embodiment practices you might have done. So we're not scanning. This is not a body scan. When we talk about embodiment, we're talking about inhabiting. So we're not scanning 
the surface of the body, the perimeter of the body. That can have a use and a function, um, especially in regulating um, the nervous system. It's often recommended, for example, if we're experiencing a lot of anxiety, this psychologist will recommend something like this, for example, scanning the contours of our feet in order to distract our attention, let energy ground. So there's usefulness in, in body scans, but here we're actually uh, practicing to inhabit and live within the internal space of our body. Now, practical recommendations here is that anything that you notice in your experience is the practice. So you're not trying to construct or create a perfect embodiment experience. It's actually great to approach it with curiosity, uh, patience, self-compassion. So if you notice that, ah, oh, yeah, I just, I'm remaining on the surface of my body. Great. You notice that. That's the practice. So noticing that, being with that experience, because before maybe you didn't notice that. And so you're just working with it slowly but surely. Uh, so we definitely don't need to chastise ourselves and say, why am I on the surface? I need to be in. No, no. That's the practice. And all of us are going to have, we have a different constellation of our experience of how we feel present in the body and how we feel contracted in the body or how we feel not in the body, out of the body some way. It's all going to be unique to each of us, even if there are qualities like awareness itself seems universal, you know, but our embodiment experience is going to be different. So some of the other ways that there's a myriad of ways in which we can feel not present in the body, a common way, especially in the world of meditation, but it's not universal is experiencing the body from the head down. And I like to make gestures here to communicate this. So it's often like, okay, I'm gonna pay attention to the body. The, the mind's eye turns down and starts looking at the body. I have a body, here it is down here, and I'm looking at it. And there is a connection and experience with the body. But again, if we notice we're doing that, okay, it's great. Be curious about that. Oh, I tend to experience my body from up here, okay. What's that like? I want to befriend that experience slowly but surely to, to listen to what's going on. Um, but that's a distinction. So we're not just scanning the body from the top down. But there are other ways like we could, like I said, as you do these kinds of practices, you will see your own constellation of how that happens. So we might find that we live in the back part of our body or the front part of our body or more up in our you know, neck and head. Who knows what it might be? So just pay attention to these really interesting ways that uh, these patterns emerge. And another footnote here is that these patterns usually emerge because of a really intelligent response to overwhelm in our life. So it could be traumatic experiences from childhood. It could be stress that's happening. Well, you know, living in the middle of a pandemic can do it. So we were, we're trying to cope with overwhelm and the body starts to do different things. Our emotions, our thoughts, and body, starts, they start working in unison to cope. So that's another reason to have some curiosity and, and self-love in this kind of practice because these things have, have arisen with uh, some intelligence. I mentioned uh, percentages earlier. This is a, a recommendation that I'll, I give a lot, and I. Usually we'll say in the instructions as well, when we're doing embodied awareness practice, think about percentages. So one of the first instructions is to inhabit our feet and maybe you feel not in your feet at all. Okay. But maybe you feel 1% present in your left foot. Notice that. Let yourself cherish that 1% a little bit. Don't turn it into a, I need to be all or nothing, you know, uh, and then cause a, you know, make it into a problem. So another distinction that occurred to me the other day that could be helpful, uh, especially in the world of meditation uh, and Buddhist meditation, where we work with the mind a lot. One of the first things we are usually instructed on and notice is the difference between thoughts and mind or the distinction of thoughts and mind itself or thoughts and awareness itself. So wherever there is a thought, there is awareness. 
but we can have an experience of awareness without thoughts. Yeah. At first when we sit down and we've never meditated before. Yeah. We know we have thoughts. We can say that all the time. I have, I had this thought the other day. I thought this, but we sit down and we notice the stream of thoughts. And at first it's like overwhelming, like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe how much I think. And it's like nonstop. And then as the mind settles in practice, we start noticing gaps in thoughts. We notice that, Oh, there's a gap without thoughts and it has certain qualities, maybe stillness, spaciousness. And then sometimes we get focused on the gap, right? We say, Oh, well, what I need to do is live in the gap. Thoughts are a problem that the spaciousness and stillness of mind is where it's at, which at first may be useful to, to cultivate the capacity to attune to mind itself, but thoughts are not a problem either in the end. Um, but we work with the mind and thoughts and regardless of whatever thought is arising, we're not really getting involved in the content of the, of the thoughts per se in some meditations, but it is helpful to distinguish that mind and thoughts. Same thing with embodied awareness. The body is constantly changing. Our emotions are changing. Our thoughts are changing. So in that sense, there's never going to be some perfect experience of the body. There's imperfection where there's pain in the body. Some days we're, you know, we have, we have chronic pain. Some days we wake up, we're super tired. We have a stomach ache or a headache. We have emotions that get contracted in the body. All that's happening. And I'm proposing, and this is what's proposing these embodiment awareness practices, that we can attune to a quality that's ever present in our experience throughout our body, similar to mind. And really that's the awareness part that we can attune to something that feels already whole, still spacious, uninjurable in that embodied awareness, all kinds of things can be happening that are imperfect, messy, and that don't feel good. So by, Acknowledging this, we want to allow ourselves the possibility of attuning to something we can rest into in our experience regardless of what's happening. And we acknowledge uh, that there's stuff to work with and things aren't perfect. And actually this embodied awareness can be very supportive to work with things like healing, uh, especially uh, trauma work. one more quote here for embodied awareness. And so she uses uh, the term fundamental consciousness. Mm, whether that term works for you or not, I, I think I've given you enough prep there to, you can substitute, it, you know, simply with awareness too, I think. But once we have attuned to fundamental consciousness in the body, throughout the body, our realization continues to develop. It pervades more of our body and becomes increasingly clear, symmetrical and stable. So that's something that you might notice over time as you work with an embodied awareness practice is that that experience becomes more clear. There's a symmetry. So as I mentioned earlier, maybe it feels asymmetrical at first, you know, maybe you feel part of your body, but not the other. That's okay. That's very, very natural, normal. Um, and over time you might notice more and more symmetry and that your experience of embodied awareness becomes more and more stable, just like you would working with, only awareness, only mind, you find that mind can become more clear, more uh, luminous, more stable. Same thing, except experience throughout our body. And really, in the way that we've been talking here, it becomes uh, what can be referred to as a non-dual experience, where everything is happening all at once, and we're resting as that. And then last, uh, just to mention movement, because in, in meditation, the Buddhist world, we can get really focused on stillness, which is often really important up front. We, we like need to cultivate the ability to settle so that way we can then work with our experience. But as you'll notice in this practice that we're going to do, we're, we're trying to allow stillness and movement at the same time. So try to recall your most still moments in meditation. Maybe it was a, a brief moment or maybe it was a whole meditation session or maybe you're on a retreat and you were coasting and it felt just still. Remember also that you're breathing the entire time. <laughs> so there was movement the entire time during that still experience. And maybe you found your way to the stillness through the movement actually. But I'm putting that out there as like a proposition to in your, in your practice that movement is not in opposition to stillness. 
they both happen at the same time. But we might work with one or the other separately to, to make uh, the capacity stronger. So we might work with just stillness so that feels really stable. But then we want to incorporate movement. So we notice stillness at the same time we notice movement. That's part of embodiment too. Because in our embodied experience, there is stillness and there's movement. 